today's world, there are many logical reasons to think that being alive kind of sucks ass. I mean, what's not to love? The ice caps are melting, gas prices are rising, there's not enough space to support the growing population, there are children in some places that don't have access to clean water, robots are taking everyone's jobs and they're gonna kill us all, cancer's a thing, the list goes on. But there is one thing we can all look forward to the future and be glad about. And that is the fact that any day now, some jumpy Asian dude can get mad at whatever some loud orange guy says that the push of a button can launch the world's population into a nuclear winter. Well, once one immediately vaporized, that is. Nuclear weapons are by far the most dangerous type of weapon mankind has created to date, so it's not unreasonable to assume that humanity first discovered how to blow shit up so thoroughly with years of dedicated, methodical scientists focusing on nothing else but creating it to get it done. I mean, that's how science works, right? Well, I'll answer that question with another question. If that's really what happened, why in the world would anyone want to make a video about it? This is the story of how it actually happened, how some hairless monkey on a big flying rock around some hot gas in the middle of nothingness, found out the means to completely annihilate themselves and everything else on the planet. This is Lisa Meitner, how humanity stumbled onto how to end itself. The year is 1878. It is a cool autumn day in early November and Hedwig Meitner is finally permitted to leave the hospital where she has just given birth. In her arms, she holds a third of her eight children, little two-day-old Elise, as they head back to their home in Vienna, Austria, where she grows up and from early as eight years old, shows great interest in the fields of math and science, even going as far as to keep a journal of her research under her pillow when she slept. However, at the time, this interest wasn't exactly the most common, as made obvious by the countless number of female names in science. So, fast forward to when it's time to go into secondary school, and she wanted to continue her education, and you could probably guess what the state's response was. No. Nope. Fortunately for Lisa, however, she had the support of her parents, and with their help, was able to go on to receive a private education in physics, and receive her external matura from the academ academic, the fuck it, the A gymnasium in 1901. Wait, 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 hold up! Didn't you just say that girls weren't allowed in secondary school like two seconds ago? If that's true, then how'd she get her diploma? Well, first of all, don't interrupt me, and second. She was able to receive her diploma because a little while after she finished her public schooling, the Austrian government began to need female physicians, like badly, so they started recruiting. However, these recruits, even though they literally had the job, still weren't considered certified. But when word spread about what was happening, public opinion gradually shifted from ew, girls have cooties, to hey, maybe, just maybe, girls can go to school and they won't completely suck ass. So, the policy was changed so that females could attend university as long as they passed the graduation test, no secondary school required. So, she got tutored, passed, and that's how she got her diploma. Now, can we get back to the actual story please? So, the year is now 1901, and she's now a university student. However, that part's kind of boring, so let's go forward some more. It is now the summer of 1906, and Lisa Minor receives her doctor's degree in physics, making her the second woman to receive a doctorate in any science from the university. However, there weren't any career opportunities in Vienna, so in 1907, she moves to Berlin, Germany. And while there, she also becomes the first woman in Max Planck class to attend his lectures, so no boogie. Just the guy who basically created quantum mechanics and made it possible for, you know, computers and the internet to even exist, but it, it's whatever. Anyway. She eventually ended up as Planck's assistant, and in 1909, she partnered with chemist Otto Hahn to try and understand how different substances produce different types of radiation. The problem was, though, that the head of the institute they were working at didn't allow girls because he said, in general, please. He was afraid that the hair would catch fire. Anyway, they were still able to conduct their research because he agreed to let them use the basement since it had a separate entrance, so that, you know, when her cooties made her hair burst into flames, it wouldn't be his problem. Keep in mind though, the radiation was a fairly new topic, so there was a lot of research still to be done. Their research included things like what happened to different atoms when they released radiation, and they even discovered some new isotopes. Their most important research, however, began in the 30s, when it was discovered that when you shoot a bunch of these little round thingies and some other little round thingies, they shoot off some more round thingies and get lighter. After learning of this, Miner and Hahn, plus another guy named Fritz Strassmann, 
like all other physicists at the time, started to signal around things at each other too, just trying to understand how the reaction worked. Well, until they were interrupted by this guy. When Hitler annexed Austria, Meitner, being of Jewish background, decided that it would probably be a good time to, you know, get the fuck out of there. So Meitner moved to Stockholm, Sweden, where she continued to write Hahn about their research, and a couple months later, Hahn traveled to Sweden to share with her some weird results. When they performed the experiment with uranium, what they ended up with was radium, which according to their calculations, made no fucking sense. So Meitner suggested that Hahn and Strassman do more research on this so-called radium. And when they did, they realized that what they had wasn't actually radium at all. What they had was barium, an element half uranium size, which then made Hahn and Strassman say, what the fuck? How could shooting neutrons at uranium make it turn into something literally half its size? So Han sent the letter back to Meitner, telling her what had happened and asking for her help explaining it. At the time, Meitner was also being visited by her nephew, Otto Frisch, who just also happened to be a nuclear physicist, because why the fuck not? So they tried to come up with an explanation together. Eventually, Meitner proposed that they thought of the atoms the way some others were at the time, as liquid droplets. And then when the neutrons hit the uranium droplet, they caused it to stretch and split to do smaller ones. From there, they calculated that when the uranium split, it split into barium, krypton, a bunch of neutrons, and a shit ton of energy. Now, to fully grasp just how important this discovery was, you first have to understand just how powerful a reaction in nuclear fission is. Let me put it like this, for every single gram of uranium, if done right, you can output 162,000 kilojoules of electricity, which by the way, is enough energy to power an average American home for a full day and a half. And to put that in perspective, to achieve the same yield using fossil fuels, mineral oil will take 10 kilograms, aka 10,000 times the amount, to produce the same amount of electricity. And to get the same result using coal, you'd need 14. And with a kilogram, you'd get 162,000 megajoules of electricity. And have to power that same home for 4 years, 2 months, 4 days, 19 hours, and 41 minutes. But no, that those numbers are only what you get after the energy is converted. The okay, okay, we get it. Nuclear fission is really cool. What's your point already? The point is, cunt, that nuclear fission is extremely powerful. You already said that. <sighs> extremely powerful, because Pond the Strassman was in the hands of the Germans, who, as stated earlier, were doing some uh, questionable things at the time. And Miner, knowing how bad it could be if the massive amounts of energy produced if fission was weaponized, added a warning in the paper she published in Frisch about the dangers of the reaction. When the paper spread, the rest of the scientific community was understandably alarmed. So, three physicists from the US decided to get Albert Einstein, aka the daddy of physics, to write a letter to US President Roosevelt about the issue. And when he did, Roosevelt responded by beginning development of America's own atomic bomb under the name the Manhattan Project. Miner was offered a position in creating the bomb, but declined as she was a pacifist and was against the idea of using science to destroy. Nevertheless, the project continued development and in the summer of 1945, the world's first atomic bomb was detonated in Alamogordo, New Mexico. After the war, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of nuclear fission was awarded to Otto Hahn. Even though Miner found out how it worked and explained the mechanics of the reaction, Hahn got the credit because he was the one who physically did the experiment. Miner spent the rest of her career doing other work in nuclear science, including working on the R1, Sweden's first ever nuclear reactor, before retiring and moving to the UK in 1960, which is also where she spent the rest of her life before dying in 1968 at the age of 89. Normally at this point of the video, the thing to do here would be to say something deep and spiritual about Miner's life and how she was an inspiration to science or whatever. However, I feel like the best words to include her story are the ones on her tombstone, which read as follows. Lisa Meitner, a physicist who never lost her humanity. And for anyone who cares, Meitner's contributions were eventually recognized. She was awarded the Enrico Fermi Award for the discovery in 1966, and in 1982, element 109 on the periodic table was named after her in remembrance.